Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Joseph Hamill from University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, he's been collaborating with biomechanics for 40 years or so, <laughs> and a lot. And he's going to give us a very nice talk this afternoon, and actually two more talks tomorrow. Joe, thanks. Thank you very much for coming, and I'm looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Um, the reason why I got interested in this particular topic, there were, there were two reasons. Uh, the first reason was I made a comment to someone one time that I thought changing football patterns was stupid. And I had absolutely no evidence to support that comment, so I thought I should do a lot of studies to support my comment. It's always bad when you make a comment like that with no evidence. The second reason that I like this topic is that uh, humans are the only animal, so to speak, that use multiple football patterns. You know, if you think like horses run on their toes, those a whole family of animals called ungulates, they run on their toes. Chimpanzees, our closest animal relative, only use one football pattern. They run very flat-footed. But we use at least three different kinds of football patterns. And that's where I'll start. with the different patterns. The first one is referred to as a rear foot pattern. And it's referred to as a rear foot pattern because you contact the ground with your heel first, roll forward, and toe off. So I'll refer to that as the rear foot pattern. Oops. The second is the forefoot pattern and this is a unique pattern because you land on the ball of your foot very far forward and the heel never touches the ground. So those are the, the two main ones. But there is also a third that is referred to as the midfoot pattern. And this is the one that is most misunderstood. The midfoot pattern is strange because you land on the forefoot, much like the forefoot pattern, but the heel actually touches down. You can see the heel touching down in this case. Now, this is shot, this video was shot very, very, very fast. What it looks like when you actually watch someone run like this, that the foot lands completely flat, but it doesn't. So, when you look at forefoot and rear foot runners, there have been three major studies that have been done over the years. In 1983, um, at this point in the 10 and 20 kilometer um, point of a marathon race, they found that 81% of all runners were rear foot. And they found actually zero were true forefoot runners. In another study done by Hashikawa in Japan, and they analyzed the elite runners at the 9.3 mile mark of a half marathon, which is um, about midway in a half marathon. And they found that 75% of all runners were rear foot. Only 1% were true forefoot. And 24% we're in this midfoot range. Now you would think, just looking at that, that there would be no argument that most people run rear foot, which is true. But that's not quite the end of the argument. In another study, they found basically similar results. This study was actually done in the part of the United States where I come from, uh, in New England but the results are very similar. Now, the question was, we asked first, why do we have multiple football patterns? You can see 
is a logical question. And so we used a biomechanical technique called forward dynamics. In other words, we build a model, and then we gave the model different functions. Like one of the functions we said, run as economically as you can. So the model looked like this. Um, it doesn't really look like much. Okay, this is the model. And it's a two-dimensional model, and there are 11 segments. These are just the constituents of the model. And we use muscle models, 12 muscle models per leg. And this is what a hill-based muscle model looks like. You don't really have to know that. Just know that this was a model. So what we did was one of the functions that we asked the runner to do, or the model to do, was run as economically as you can, as you would like in a marathon. And the model always ran with the heel toe back. It always did that. The next thing that we asked the, the model to do was to run as economically as you can, as fast as you can. And what it did was it used this kind of midfoot pattern. The problem was that the midfoot pattern actually used more energy than the rear foot pattern. And it used actually one watt per kilogram of body mass, which is really substantial. The third cost function, he said, run as fast as you can. Don't worry about energy, just run fast. And what happened was, the model ran with a four foot pattern. So what we came to the conclusion was that you use different footfall patterns for different reasons. If you want to run fast, you'll probably run faster if you use a four-foot pattern. But if you want to run a long way, as you would say in a marathon, you'll use the heel-toe pattern. And if you want to do both, <clears throat> it will cost you some, but you will run faster. You'll use the mid-foot pattern. So you can see, for example, in athletics, if you want to run a marathon, you're probably going to do this. If you want to run 100 meters, you're probably going to run like that. And if you want to run somewhere in between, let's say 800 meters, uh, 1,500 meters, maybe even up to 5,000 meters, you're going to run like this. So it's very task specific. That was our conclusion. OK, now getting back to the research, there's really very, very little evidence to show that running with the forefoot pattern or running with the midfoot pattern is a healthy alternative. There's no evidence to show that you should change. On the other hand, there's little evidence to show that rear foot running is better than midfoot running or forefoot running. Now, if you go to the internet and you look up forefoot running or even midfoot running, you'll find there are several companies that will sell you, um, you know, making you a better runner by changing the way you run. And most of these are changing the way you run from a rear foot to a forefoot pattern. And they make all of these wild claims. So the first claims that they make, um, I've used Technic A and B because I didn't want to name the um, companies that do this. But it says Technic A prevents injuries and dramatically improves your athletic performance. Technic B takes the pound, the pain, and the potential damage out of the sport of running. 
in terms of efficiency, transitioning to Technique A, which is a four-foot run path, makes you running more efficient through the use of gratuitous forces. As the professor stated, that I've been doing this for about 40 years, and I have no idea what a gratuitous force is. I don't think anybody has an idea what it is. Technique B will be easier for you if you'll be a more Those all sound like great claims, but there is absolutely no evidence, none, to show that any of these are correct. But what are they really saying? Well, what they're really saying is three things. That changing to this four foot or four foot pattern, one, is metabolically efficient. Two, it will decrease the impact forces of running. And three, will reduce running related injuries. Now, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to try and tell you that these are not correct. So let's start off with running metabolically more efficient. One of my graduate students, uh, Alice Gruber, actually published this paper. And basically the conclusion was that it's not more economical to change the way you run. It just is not. So these are the data. This is steady state oxygen consumption. So these runners were all habitually rear foot runners who ran for about 10 minutes in each pattern, both forefoot and rear foot. And you can see, you know, some runners actually decrease their efficiency. Most of them stay the same and some increase. So basically, as a general rule, you never want to base a conclusion on one runner. You base it on a group of runners. And the conclusion here is no difference. It doesn't matter whether you run forefoot or you run rear foot. No difference in economy. So that first claim is not true. It's not more metabolically efficient to change. However, we can find one thing that is unexpected. We found that carbohydrate oxidation was different. Now what carbohydrate oxidation means is that as you run, you burn off more carbohydrates. And when you burn off the carbohydrates, it's sort of like what we call it in the United States, hitting the wall. If you watch 400 meter runners, they sprint as far as they can, and you can see them struggling in the last 10 to 15 meters. That's hitting the wall. That means they've used up all of their carbohydrates. What we found that when you ran forefoot versus rear foot, you use up these carbohydrate stores much faster. Even at a medium running pace, you're using up the carbohydrate stores much faster. Now, fast running speed doesn't matter because you know, you're going to burn them all up equally over a short period of time. But the thing is, that by changing the way you run to a forefoot or midfoot, and you try to run for a distance, you're going to hit the wall sooner. So it's not beneficial. Now, of course, the people in the 400 meter run, you know, we would hit the wall probably at 200 meters. They hit the wall maybe at 350 meters because they're trained. But still, they do hit the wall. So, that's metabolically more efficient. Now, decreases the impact forces in running is probably the most critical thing. This is the most critical. And it all stems from this paper by Dan Lieberman. And he went to Kenya in Africa, and he found people who had never been worn shoes before who ran. And he noticed when they ran, they always exhibited this kind of ground reaction force. And they always ran 
with the forefoot pattern. So when they ran with shoes on, you could see that they're going to contact the heel first, and they always exhibited this pattern. Okay. You notice that they're different. And his conclusion was that it's better to run forefoot. And in fact, it's better to run barefoot and forefoot. Now I'm going to tell you why that's not true. These were data collected in our lab. This, in the, you can see here, is the forefoot pattern. And in the red is the rear foot pattern. And you notice this thing here in rear foot that you don't see in forefoot. And that is referred to as the impact peak. And what people like Lieberman said was, well, there's no impact peak here. This has got to be bad for you. But there's no impact peak here, so this has got to be good for you. It makes sense, sort of. But if you look into it more deeply, you'll see that it's not true. If we do what's referred to as a Fourier analysis, and this Fourier analysis plots frequency versus the amplitude. And you look at the ground reaction force. This is the impact peak. This other peak here is referred to as an active peak. This is the peak that pushes you off the ground. But you notice that the impact peak has frequencies from 10 to 20 hertz. And the active peak is somewhere in here, less than 10 hertz. If we do that with a forefoot and a rear foot, the rear foot in red, forefoot here, and you look at the 10 to 20 hertz range, you'll see that there is a forefoot impact as well as a rear foot impact. So just because that peak is not there doesn't mean that there's no impact. It just means there's an impact on the different part of the foot. Now, why do you not see this impact in forefoot running? Well, it's a very simple explanation. In rear foot running, this peak here occurs very early in the support phase. In rear foot running, or in forefoot running, it occurs. There is a impact peak, but it occurs much later. Now I'll show you why that's not true. This comes from a paper. It's a 1992. And what was done here was they looked at the acceleration of the contacting limb and then the acceleration of the rest of the body. This was the contacting limb. And this was the rest of the body. And when you add these two things together, you get this. What happens in the forefoot contact is this impact peak is delayed. So when you add them together, it seems to disappear. But it's really there. Now, we showed this using the notion of wavelets. Now, a wavelet is, again, it's a frequency, but this time, frequency versus time. And then the colors, the hotter the color, the reds and yellows indicate a higher frequency, or sorry, a, a greater amplitude. So what you see here, this is the rear foot impact. And of course you can see the, the greater amplitudes actually occur, not an impact. If you look at the forefoot, what you see is a, a smaller impact, and it occurs later. So when you add these all up, you get that thing without an impact peak. So the notion that there's no impact peak, therefore no impact, is ridiculous. 
the question that often comes up is, does this impact people cause injuries? And the answer would seem to say no. Running on hard surfaces did not increase injuries over when running on soft surfaces. You would think running on hard surfaces you'd have a greater impact of heat and therefore more injuries. That's not true. In another study, uh, actually a set of studies, the incidence of osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis is thought to result from impacts on a hard surface. The incidence of osteoarthritis was not any different in runners and non-runners. And you would think, logically, that runners would have osteoarthritis, but they don't. So the question that's always asked, and it's asked to me quite often, do runners get injured? Yes. Did they get injured with the kinds of injuries caused by impact? No. Well, I say that categorically because I have really no evidence, but that's my feeling. In a very interesting study done at the University of Calgary in Canada, what they found was subjects with greater impact peaks had significantly fewer injuries. These are the people with low impacts, and these are the people with high impacts. Okay. So what you find is the relative injury frequency with the higher impacts is actually less than it is with low impacts, which should be the exact opposite of what you would think. So, does changing the way you run decrease your chances of uh, increasing the impact forces of running? No, it doesn't. So, the last thing is running related injuries. And the only way to really prove running related injuries cause injury, or caused by a footfall pattern or not is doing an epidemiological study. Now, epidemiological studies have to be large studies with large numbers of people, usually in the thousands of runners. And there's only been two with sufficiently large sample. Both of these were done in Germany. And this one by Kleindienst only had 471 runners. And they found no difference in the risk of injury four foot or rear foot run. And what was interesting was the suggested injury site was different. Okay. In other words, what happened was the um, four foot runners got more soft tissue injuries, more muscle and cartilage and ligament injuries. Rear foot runners got more skeletal injuries more stress fractures, things like that. <clears throat> now Walter, two years later, he used 1,203 runners and found exactly the same results. Exactly. So the evidence shows that in these two studies, two large scale studies, that changing the way you run doesn't influence or was not influenced by your footfall pattern. So, if we look at this, it's not metabolically more efficient. It does not decrease the impact forces. And it reduces running related injuries. It does not. And in fact, it may cause certain injuries. And I'll show you a couple of injuries that I think is caused by four foot running. These are three that I think are very obvious. Achilles tendonitis. You're all familiar with the Achilles tendon. In forward running, when the heel doesn't touch the ground, the Achilles tendon is activated or taut all the time. Throughout the, this is the contact period. If you look at the rear foot, for about the first 20%, there is no stress on the Achilles tendon. 
None at all. <clears throat> By continual loading, like this, where the Achilles tendon is always stressed, that could be a cause for Achilles tendonitis. <clears throat> and plantar fasciitis in, oops, in rear foot and forefoot. So let's look at these. We did a study where we looked at the coordination of the forefoot and the rear foot. What normally happens is you have the rear foot going to evert, rolls rolling medially, and then the forefoot rolls medially. They don't happen at the same time. The rear foot goes, then the forefoot goes. So, if we look at the heel-toe pattern here, what we see happen in this order, the rear foot goes and the forefoot goes. If we look at the forefoot pattern, what we see is this. They both go at the same time. Now, why is this important? It's important because here, the foot is acting like a rigid structure. And the plantar fasciitis, fasciitis or fascia, in this case, is always under tension. If any kind of fascia or tendon or ligament is always under tension, that means it's stressed and it may, by virtue of overuse, become injured. Now the last one that I'm going to talk about is telephemoral pain. And this was another study done by Plunkins in Germany. And he showed these data. This is the knee abduction moment. And if you notice the difference here between forefoot and rear foot. And he showed the knee um, internal rotation or external rotation moment. And you see here the forefoot and the rear foot. So there's a huge difference. In another study, it was suggested that increased VA deduction and external rotation moments are related to telephemoral pain. So it's clear that this situation could be a precursor up into telephemoral pain. So what are the conclusions of all of this from my conclusions? Well, the research suggests that changing one's football pattern is not beneficial. I am not saying that it's not beneficial for everyone. It may be beneficial for one or two people, but you cannot base a projection of the whole population based on one or two people. And you will hear what I call anecdotes. You know, so and so switched to being a four foot runner and they stopped being injured. It, that's possible. Okay. But you couldn't say that all of you should switch to a four foot running pattern based on the research. And what I'm suggesting is that the change from rear foot to four foot, generally, for most people, is not beneficial may result in stressing tissue that in the rear foot pattern you wouldn't stress. And this may actually result in a different kind of injury. So, thank you, and I, I, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hanger. Any questions? Hi. Hello. Well, uh, the shoe type can influence on the football pattern. Can the, the shoe type can influence on football pattern? Yes, it can. 
actually, you should talk to the professor here because he just published a paper on that. Um, yes, it can. Um, you know, if you use what, what are referred to as minimalist shoes, are you familiar with minimalist shoes? Those generally um, are supposed to take the place of barefoot running, and they do tend to make people move more forward on the, on the foot. And so people tend to, in those shoes, become more forefoot runners. If you use traditional shoes, um, most people who use traditional shoes are, in fact, rear foot runners. It's about 80 to 90 percent of the population do. Um, so again, um, the thing is that what's happening, at least in the United States, is that minimal shoes are not selling as well as they did a few years ago. People are going back to the old um, traditional running shoe. And that's mainly because a lot of people got injured in the minimal shoes. Very good question. In terms of performance, do you have any idea of how this two running patterns can affect? Like? <clears throat> well, yeah, that's what I was trying to say in the task specificity. You know, if you're going to run 100 meters, it's probably not wise to try and run heel toe. It will take you longer. And there was one <clears throat> small, very small study done uh, several years ago, and they had people run heel-toe and forefoot over 60 meters, and the people running forefoot always run faster. However, if I'm going to run a marathon, or even if I'm going to run 10,000 meters, I am probably not going to run forefoot. Okay. Thank you. Uh, actually, I'm not finished yet. Sorry. Um, there's a friend of mine who works for Nike, actually did a study at the um, Olympic uh, trials, not the recent ones, but a few years ago. And what he found in the 10,000 meters, the way people ran the 10,000 meter run race was that they would run the first kilometer or two they would run um, midfoot. For the majority of the race, they would run rear foot. And at the end of the race, they would actually run midfoot again. So running rear, um, rear foot was basically to conserve energy. You must be tired of uh, answering questions about the board to run, based on the board to run book, you know? Oh, board to run. Yeah. So there, there's, um, in the book it stated the, the, the heel, heel foot, the, no, the rear foot, rear foot, yeah, that's right, uh, was kind of uh, more popularized by Nike when they created the, the shoes with the, you know, the shoes in the, in the back. Is that true? Is that, does that make any sense? There's absolutely no evidence to show that's true. And the reason why there's no evidence to show that's true is long before Nike, it was a heel and shoe, even in the running shoes. Now, I was a runner. I was a sprinter. And long before most of you were born, in the 1960s, when I was sprinting, my shoes had heel on them. Yeah, even in sprinting, my, my spikes have a heel. They don't now, but they did then. And most of the training shoes had heels in the shoes. Nike didn't come about until the mid-1970s. Okay. So that's a really a ridiculous claim. Um, you know, my answer to Born to Run is, you know, if that were the case, that Nike caused people to run heel-toe. That would mean, before about 1975, every single person who was a runner ran forward. 
And we don't know if that's true or not, but we certainly don't know also that it's not true. So if you look at the proportions of rear foot runners, how in heaven's name do 80 to 90 percent of all people now run heel toe? Do you think Nike costs that? I don't think so. That's a very good question, though. Um, I, I think Border Run is a very, very nice story. It's a very nice story, but the biomechanics in Border Run are terrible. It's more like an anthropology question, right? Yeah. Well, that's uh, actually, I've been working with an anthropologist, and this is a, Dan Lieberman and I discuss this quite frequently. He says that when ancient men started to run, they ran forefoot. And I say no, that when ancient men started to run, they ran heel toe. And so far, he has not very convincing evidence, and I have not very convincing evidence, but I think my evidence is a little bit more convincing than his. He's an anthropologist, right? Yeah, he's, an he's an anthropologist, yeah. Actually, he's a brilliant anthropologist who studies the skull. Um, he only, he only became interested in running because he is a runner. Not, not a very fast runner, but he is a runner. Thank you. And just to further go on, Joe, why do you think our ancestors would run? Who? He, why, did, why do you think our ancestors would run? Ran heel toe? Yeah. Because um, human beings are not very efficient. We don't run well when you compare us to other animals. And if my whole idea of task specificity, you know, if the fact that when we would try to run forefoot to sprint, that doesn't make sense because most of the animals that were chasing us hundreds of, you know, 100,000 years ago were much faster than us, would have caught us very easily. But what we were very good at was distance running. And there's a theory actually proposed by um, two people. One of them was Dan Lieberman, um, and it's called persistence hunting. Are you familiar with that theory? Yeah. Per persistence hunting uses the idea that humans were distance <coughs> runners. And the way they hunted animals was they would chase the animal, and the animal would run away. And then the animal because of the way they have to dissipate heat, they stop. And of course, the animals have to do the, you know, to try and get rid of heat. Okay. But the humans would catch up to the animals before they could dissipate the heat. Then they would chase them again, and the animals would run away. And the animals would try and dissipate the heat, but they couldn't dissipate at all, because the humans would jog after them, catch them, and make them run again. Eventually, the animal would overheat, fall over, the humans would come in and kill it. That's called persistence hunting. And basically, all that requires is that humans be good distance runners, not necessarily good sprinters. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why I think I'm right. It wouldn't be an argument if you didn't think you were right, though, would it? Hello, John. Uh, are there differences in foot strike pattern in the speed uh, chains or, uh, or ground or, or the ground, kind of the ground? I th that's an actual question, too. We did a study in our uh, lab, and we had people run on a concrete. Well, what we did was um, we took and we had a whole group of river runners. They were habitual river runners. And we made them take off their shoes and run on a concrete floor. Almost all of them changed to a forefoot pattern. The question is, why would they do that on a concrete floor? Because it's painful to land on your heel when you're not wearing a shoe. Well, what we did then was we had a whole runway with thick foam 
that was basically the consistency of a running shoe foam. We made them run barefoot in the running shoe around the foam. And guess what they did? They ran heel toe. So the question is, what we did was we provoked people to change the way they run because of the surface of the, on which they ran. And this is the thing in the original study that I showed you of Dan Lieberman. He was showing the person running forefoot, barefoot. In, I've been to Africa and I know the ground gets very, very hard. You know, even if it's just like clay, it gets very hard. It's like concrete. If you run on it and you try to run on your heel, it'll hurt. So I think he's missing the point in the, in the fact that if you run on a hard surface, barefoot, you're going to run forefoot. Okay. So the surface has a very, very important part to play on. of the same for stabilization, um, the trunk, the middle stabilization, the middle part of the body, uh, on the impact in the force that you are seeing. I'm sorry. Did you understand? I, I, I don't understand. <laughs> you know, your English is better than my Portuguese, but unfortunately I don't understand your English right now. <laughs> sorry. Uh, how the importance of the same for stabilization, the trunk. Mm -hmm. trunk. Yeah. Um, yeah, the trunk. On the impact, on the force that you are seeing mm -hmm. in, the, in the ground. Okay. If you remember um, the impact yes. part, that was just the leg. The other part, the bigger part, was actually the rest of the body. Yes. Yes, I understand. So, what we've been finding is the force of the rest of the body in forefoot running and rear foot running is not that much different. No. But how the leg contacts the ground is different. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, this stabilization or this control of the, this part of the, the leg uh, can be uh, help on the treatment of injuries. I don't know. Uh, if <laughs> Uh, she, she's asking if, if the runner can control better the time. Is it going to be is it going to be beneficial for in order to avoid injuries? I mean, the, how they move the tie regarding to the leg is it beneficial regarding? possible future injuries. Yeah, um, that's the argument that's made. Um, the movement of the thigh relative to the trunk is different in the two types of running. What you normally find, or what has been proposed, is that forefoot runners take shorter steps. And that means that the thigh is less flexed. Okay. And uh, rear foot runners flex the thigh more, you know, more than in forefoot runners. And what they say is that when you reduce the length of your step or your stride 
by flexing the thigh less, that, that the force of landing goes down. That's true. But then the next question comes, does the force really cause an injury? No, it's just to, yeah. to avoid. Yeah. But you're right that the thigh does change with the different yes, football patterns. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I should add to you as well, a study that we did many, many years ago. Um, actually, I think it was 1995 we did the study. And we showed that if you, all of us, have a preferred stride length, if we went out and ran and we measured your stride length, you'd find it would be just exactly match the rest of your body, your anthropometry. And if you deviate from that, you make your strides too short, too long, you will be less efficient. So when people say, oh, you know, when you run four foot, your strides are short. It's actually causing you to be less efficient when you run with a shorter stride. Berkshire Hills, and you can 
see the trees in the fall changing color. So when I go back home next week, the trees will start to change color like that. So you're all welcome to come to Massachusetts anytime and visit the University of Massachusetts. Anytime you want. Just let me know. Yes. So back to the question about the barefoot wind, wind. Okay. So you said that uh, when in soft surface, surfaces, the, they use the, the heel strike in yeah. effect, right? Yes. And then on the hard surface, use for the, yeah. the perfect strike. So what kind of situation, before the shoes were invented and had like cushions, what kind of situation was there on the earth and maybe the sand and beaches uh, that the, that the there were soft surfaces to run? I mean, before shoes and back to that anthropology question. Well, anytime you're off, um, uh, you know, a path that's well, um, that's well traveled, you know, the dirt would be softer. But when you get on uh, a well traveled path, that would probably be harder. And you're right, running on the beach, um, all you have to do is watch people run on the beach and you'll see they're all on the toe. Okay, so it's not, it's not, uh, it's not associated the the, the huge drive with shoes because there were soft surfaces before. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I don't think so at all. I think that's a, a nice fallacy, but it's not true. Questions? Oh. First of all, thank you, John, for your presentation. Very insightful for us. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, and I was, I, I thought that it was interesting the you showed us a Fourier analysis and frequency domain analysis, and we could see that the the first peak of the reaction, the ground reaction force, were associated with faster complements. Is it? Is it? The higher frequency components, yeah. Yes, higher frequency, faster. 10 to 20 hertz, yeah. Higher frequencies, then the, the second peak right, was, were slower, let's say, like that, this way. Uh, and the, the higher frequencies were actually much uh, associated with much less power. In the Is forefront it? running. Yes. Yeah, in the forefront yeah. running. So, do you think it? Is it a reason for us to not care about this first component? I mean, is it telling us that it really doesn't matter because the, the power, the, the, the overall power that these fragments are associated with are very low? Well, that's an argument that I've tried to make, but um, you know, the people who say we should run forefoot say there's a force there and we should pay attention to it. All of the other data shows that that force does not necessarily So yes, you're right. The power is much lower. I got it. Yeah, but it's more, you know, how you interpret it. Um, you know, uh, I mean, you know, I, I feel like sometimes I'm, I preach the choir in the sense that people understand what I'm saying, but then they go out and do the exact opposite. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of intuitive to think like this, but uh, even in low power frequencies, there might be an uh, injury association. Uh, yeah, like that. The, the interesting thing is when you look at the impact beam, the loading rate, that is the time it takes to get to that impact, is very steep. The second peak, the time it gets to that peak is very, very slow. And so that's why. You know, uh, people look at the impact and say, well, the loading rate is very high. But interestingly, the loading rate is higher in forefoot than it is in rear foot. Thank you. Can I make another question? Yeah. Uh, and earlier, you, you mentioned that you showed us uh, a graph of uh, energy expenditure. I think you thought one of your graduate students did this. Uh, what were the subjects uh, actually uh, rear foot runners and then they were forced to change their patterns? Uh, I would like to, mo to, to know more about the, the sample. Actually, um, they were, we had two groups 
and we merged the data from the, you know, from the, that graph. The, the two groups were habitual river runners, and we made them run four foot. And then we took habitual four foot runners, and made them run rear foot. That's and the results were the same. Perfect, perfect. I, I was wondering if they, there could be an effect of the change in their pattern, and they were not used to, to that, but if you change it with the groups, this, this variable is actually... Well, one of the interesting things is, if you notice, um, the river runners, some of them tended to improve by going to four foot. You know, a couple. What was interesting in the four foot runners, all of them tended to improve. Now, not statistically significant, but they all tended to improve by going to river foot. I have no explanation for that at all. Okay. Uh, the last one. Uh, do you know any perspective uh, on people that actually change their footfall pattern and, and did they analyze an injury associated the variable or no I, I know of no study no such study that would be a very nice study to do but um, when you do these long term studies like that with lots and lots of participants that costs a lot of money yes difficult, difficult to run out yeah I know. okay thank you John Well, as I said, um, in the 10,000 meters, they usually uh, ran hill toe for about 8,000 meters. With the first um, thousand and the last thousand, they ran more midfoot. I think the marathon, they do that the same thing. They just run longer as a rear foot runner. Uh, is it possible classifying subgroups? It could be. Yeah, I'm just talking generally. That's what appears to happen. And if you think about the study by Hashigawa and the other study by Larson, that's exactly what people did. They read most of the race rear foot. And at the beginning and ending, when they were trying to run a little bit faster, um, they would use uh, a more mid foot spread. Very few people actually in the marathon or even 10,000 meters um, ran um, four foot. But in the 100 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters, most of them run, ran for them. Or actually all of them did. No questions? <clears throat> Joe, thank you very much for your lecture. Thank you again. Thank you for listening.